Um, she's going to be here answering questions in the chat, helping out with anything that you guys may need and posting some links in there as well. Uh, just so you know, we're going to be using Jamboard a little bit today, so be ready to participate with that. And I'm really excited to get started. So on to feedback and connection. Uh, before I begin, I do want to say I had a little bit of fun making this. I let my elementary teacher flag fly and threw in some uh, Halloween references over here and there. So I apologize if it's a bit much, but I couldn't help myself. So, <clears throat> so let's get started today by thinking about feedback. I want you to consider a time when feedback was helpful and effective for you, when it was something that was really, really important to your learning process. And then also compare that to a time when this feedback was perhaps less than productive. Um, I want you to consider what qualities of those feedback examples made it productive. And then what prevented that feedback from being productive in those cases when it wasn't? And as you consider, We do have our link to our Jamboard coming up here soon, and I'll want you to just think of some ideas to toss in for those qualities of productive feedback versus those qualities of non-productive feedback. So I'll give you just a few minutes here to take some time to really consider those times when feedback for you was productive and helpful, and what those times when it wasn't so much, and what qualities each of those contained. So hop into that Jamboard and play around a little bit. See what ideas you can come up with. And for those of you that may not have had time to explore Jamboard in the past, you're going to want to go over to the sticky note button right here. Type in a note. And then pop that note where you feel it belongs. You could also, as I see some people doing typing, I see topic ideas like timely and relevant, both excellent feedback, content specific, Ooh, negative tone. Now I'm curious is, ah, there we go. That's what I was gonna ask. So that non-productive feedback, that tone being an important aspect is very interesting to consider for sure. And I love seeing the specificity here. Ooh, great use of images, bringing in that idea of next steps. Non-productive feedback when it's generalized, excellent. So I'm seeing a lot of ideas that we're going to cover in this presentation and I'm loving what I'm seeing already. This tells me that you all are of course very familiar with giving feedback. Of course, non-productive feedback is no feedback at all. Very true. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Uh, when I was a beginning teacher, my principals would do the same thing, leaving a little bit of feedback, a little positive note in my box after visiting my classroom. It really always made me feel seen. Excellent. Ooh, and that word vague as well. Oh, I like that. Junk food. Good job. Excellent. Yeah. The, those kind of junky phrases. Excellent. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and hop back into the presentation. And I wanna start with thinking about the overall value of feedback. Feedback is something that in your classroom really feeds what you're teaching. Um, a quote from the James Pennebaker, who is a well-known researcher in the area of providing feedback in learning. He says that when people are trying to learn new skills, they must get some information that tells them whether or not they're doing the right thing. Learning in the classroom is, of course, no exception. Both the mastery of content and, more importantly, the mastery of how to think require trial and error learning. And as instructors in the classroom, we're kind of that source for helping with that trial and error process. And by providing feedback, 
we guide students through trial and error and make it safe for them to fail knowing that they're going to be helped. So that's awesome. I'm really, really glad that a lot of those things in your comments are popping up here already. Now, feedback is valuable in a lot of other ways as well. Not only does it create opportunities for building that trial and error community in your classroom, but it also creates opportunities for positive reinforcement. Effective feedback builds in positive reinforcement when we're using it. And of course, if we're building in positive reinforcement, then we're also building connections with our students. This also, of course, when you're giving feedback, provides very specific means of, of improvement. It guides students along a path towards a goal. And at the same time, it provides that opportunity for constructive criticism and constructive communication as a whole between the teacher and the student. And that constructive communication, as we're going to see later on in the presentation, can flow both ways really effectively. So then we have the idea of what is the value then of connection? If part of providing feedback is to bring in connection with students, then what is the exact value of that connection that we're building? Well, we know for sure that learning is a community and, uh, and cultural construction. It's something that requires communication between individuals and it requires people to make connections. Relationship is also valuable in the learning process. It's what helps to create that atmosphere of learning. Nobody really wants to learn from someone that they can't at least build some kind of relationship with. And relationship is built on many factors. One of those being the feeling that the teacher knows you. They know your strengths, your weaknesses. In essence, that your teacher sees you. Feedback helps to show and demonstrate that your teacher, your instructor sees you in some way or another. They see your goals and want to help you along that path. Connection is what is built from that feedback. And that connection helps your students to behave better in class and also achieve their academic goals. And if our students are achieving their academic goals and behaving better in class, then the end result in a lot of ways is that teacher job satisfaction improves dramatically. Your mental health and your satisfaction in your career improves because your students are doing better and your connections with them are stronger. And that by itself is a huge reason why we value that connection with our students. And so when we were coming up with this presentation, we were, Anna and I were thinking a lot about some of the hard truths of online learning. It is a hard truth that consequences just don't really work in the online environment. There's nothing that we can do to control the students on the other side. Now there's things that we can do to influence those behaviors and that's where feedback and positive reinforcement come in. But we can't step over to the other side of the computer and provide a consequence for an action. The only real reliable form of behavior modification is feedback and behavior specific praise. Students need more feedback in the online learning environment as well. That's another hard truth. As much as we want to be able to function as a normal classroom, we know that it's going to be very difficult. And so we need to take the steps to provide more feedback, more instruction, more relationship building than we ever have before. It's kind of like turning the volume knob up to 11. We have to do that extra effort, that extra forward step in bringing in all of these things. And to quote an anonymous teacher, Online learning kind of sucks in a lot of ways. It's hard. And this is something that's difficult for all of us. But if we're focusing ourselves on that relationship piece, that building connection and providing great feedback, then we're making our own lives a lot easier. So now let's hop into meaningful feedback and what that means, what that looks like, and behavior specific praise. So feedback is a tool. 
and it's an excellent tool with high leverage in the classroom. And it works because your attention is a gift to your students. There's some programs for behavior management that really rely on this idea. Things like Nurtured Heart say that your attention is kind of like money that you're handing out in the classroom. How do you wanna spend your bucks? Feedback is a really great way to spend that attention money. And your warm, undivided attention towards your students in those feedback sessions or those one-on-one -on -one small group interactions is a great way to spend that attention. Feedback is really effective because it helps to influence student choice. Rather than us trying to control what students do and trying to exert force to make students want do what we think is best, feedback leverages our influence so that students are more motivated to perform the actions that we'd like to see, to take advantage of meeting, of taking your feedback and meeting standards and goals. So we can consider feedback as being that tool for leverage, uh, that leverage tool that influences student actions in really effective ways. So when we're considering what meaningful feedback looks like, we did a lot of research, pulled a lot of articles and found four really common ideas. One, as like, like you were all saying in the Jamboard, it has to be specific. It has to be timely. It has to be goal oriented. And the last piece is almost a completion of the rest, which is the idea of transparency. And that's gonna be in how you communicate with your students. So let's dive into what that specificity in communication looks like. So when we're trying to be as specific as possible, you should consider a few different things. Consider exactly what the learner did well. If you're in a situation where you're providing feedback, really think about what was it that that student did that was so great. I know I'm guilty as anybody else of having a classroom discussion and saying, great job, Jimmy, and then moving right on without actually noting what, that, what Jimmy did that was so great. But stopping and thinking to yourself, okay, what did he do that was really, what, that was really wonderful? And maybe even considering what did he do differently today than he did before? Or what growth do I see since last time? Those ideas will really help you to bringing, bring that specificity into your feedback to your students. So going back to the example of having a classroom discussion, you might be having a classroom discussion with your whole group and Jimmy, a quiet student, finally raises his hand to speak. He hasn't done that before and it's a new thing. And when you call on him, you're very excited to hear what he has to say, but he's pretty reluctant to speak now. He's scared and kind of clams up again. There's still an opportunity for feedback. He did a great job in raising his hand, which was growth over what he has done before. And that's an opportunity that you should take so that you can promote that behavior again. That's a way to influence that behavior so that, he, so that he is intrinsically motivated to repeat it. Now, as you all said before in the Jamboard as well, that feedback has to be timely. It's pretty useless if I see a behavior on Monday and then on Friday I say something about it. Students can't really connect that cognitively and it's much harder for them to improve upon something when there's a great deal of time between feedback, between actions and feedback. So we need to make sure that when we give feedback, we're doing it as timely as possible. Now in the online environment, that can pose some challenges. It's really hard to do this verbally constantly throughout the day, especially when we have so much trouble getting things moving in the classroom already and building momentum online. So it's hard to stop and give verbal reinforcement. So later on in the presentation, we're gonna talk about how some of this can look in the virtual setting. The cool thing with immediate feedback, when you consider timeliness in your equation when you are giving feedback, is that there's a lot of research that demonstrates that students who receive immediate feedback show, great, show a great deal more growth than students that don't. Also, student comprehension of material improves a great deal when they're receiving feedback in a timely manner. 
So for example, in small groups, when you are in your reading groups with your students, providing specific feedback in timely moments in those interactions can help those small reading groups to improve their comprehension of what they're reading and their application of what they're doing. So feedback has immediate, out, immediate outcomes, which again, makes it a high leverage tool. Now that idea of goal orientation. When we're thinking about making our feedback goal oriented, we need to think about how we're framing our feedback. We need to frame it in terms of how the learner is advancing towards a goal, objective, or standard. So this can sometimes require teaching your students to set goals. Many kids in the elementary setting don't really have a strong idea of how to set their own academic goals. And something that we can do as instructors that even connects to the CASEL standards and social and emotional learning is help students to set goals. And that way, when you're providing feedback, you can reference those goals and help students to see that they are making gains towards it and how they can further those gains toward with next steps. Goal oriented feedback is essentially stepping stones toward that goal and result that we want to see in our students. And now that idea of transparency. Students need to know why you are giving the feedback that you're giving. Now, sometimes they already know because of the goals they've set for themselves. But sometimes in terms of standards and overall learning goals, it's harder for students to see that as an end product. So when we're providing feedback, we need to make it clear that students are taking steps towards that goal that this piece of feedback is just one small part in the overall picture of their progress. So we really need to take, take the steps to keep learners involved in this learning process. And feedback is a great way in which to do that. So consider what makes each step in the learning process purposeful towards that greater goal as you're planning and as you're making feedback. How does this itsy bitsy step of making sure that we're raising our hand to participate in classroom discussions, how does that lead towards the greater goal of public speaking? So here's a few examples of feedback that I threw together. Um, these are things where I, I try to keep all of those aspects of what great feedback can look like. Now, is all of your feedback going to look like this in the actual classroom setting? No, it's pretty impossible to always give feedback that has all of those parts and is timely. So could, these are mainly just considerations for things that you can bring to your feedback when you have the time. So for example, down here we have, Nick, your participation in class today, in the class discussion today was excellent. You did a great job in stating your point and defending it with evidence from the text. You've made awesome progress. I'd really like to see you applying that to your nonfiction reading too. So in this whole statement, I'm saying that his progress was excellent. I'm giving that positive feedback, that reinforcement. I'm telling him exactly what he did well. And then I'm stating, here's a next step that you might take towards your overall goals. And that next step can be very, very valuable. Now we're going to also need to be careful with some of these statements because if we word them just, to, just slightly differently, it can sound to students as though we're controlling their actions. And we need to make sure that we're trying our best to guide them and influence them and not yank them towards a goal. So uh, one more example that I'll read out to you. Uh, you did a great job turning this in on time, Geneva. You are showing growth in your ability to organize yourself and manage your time. This is a step towards your goal of having all of your classwork done before the weekend. So here I'm providing feedback on more of a behavioral goal. Feedback works in terms of both behavior and academics. And so consider how you can help your students to set goals behaviorally as well with those behaviors like turning in work on time, participating in class, commuting, communicating with their peers, 
These are all things that students can make goals towards and that can guide your feedback. So now we're going to take a little bit of time to practice some feedback. In this situation, we've got Molly, a second grader, who is a struggling reader. No, this isn't a real story at all. Hmm. Oh, and I see, Amanda, you uh, mentioned moat. I'm going to put uh, that's already in the presentation. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Molly's a second grader and a struggling reader. She often makes mistakes when reading out loud and cannot recall much of what she read. Today, she volunteered to read a paragraph out loud to the class, and she read the segment with few errors. What feedback would you, would you give her? And so in the Jamboard, what you're going to do is go to your second page of the Jamboard, if you still have it open. If not, go ahead and go back to that link. And I want you to think about that situation with Molly, our second grade student. She read out loud and she did a great job when she normally doesn't read to the class and she struggles in this area. What kind of feedback can we give her? So I'll give you a few moments to try that out and see what you'd like to post. Um, and I'll leave this up here for right now. And consider too making a note of how you can make this timely in the classroom setting, especially online. And remember, you can either type on a note or type in a text box, whichever one you'd like. And our goal is to try to see if we can make this timely, specific, goal-oriented, and transparent. One of the reasons why I love Jamboard is seeing all of these answers populate. I find it really exciting every single time. Um, just seeing all of these answers pop up. Ooh, beautiful. I love how this one even added in a bit. Ta you did a fantastic word job tapping out the words you didn't know pointing out that specific skill that she was using. This will help you towards reading fluently and smoothly. Awesome. That's very specific feedback. Very nice. And again, pointing out those strategies, that great effort. Effort in itself is something to reward. Very nice. I love seeing how we're applying some of that specificity, especially. And I really enjoy seeing the ones that are also bringing in that goal. Ooh, this is interesting. You showed great confidence in yourself. That's something else that we can also bring into our feedback, right? With that specificity, it's not always just about that academic goal. Sometimes it's also about that social and emotional thing as well. Molly didn't just read out loud because she finally felt like she could. She also read out loud because she overcame a fear. She overcame something that was blocking her. And that is a really cool thing to reward. Ooh, 
Ooh, I love how you persevered. Our goal is to understand the text when we read, read out loud. So yeah, exactly. So then as far as a next step, you can say, hey, you did a great job with the mechanics of reading here. I love how you chunked those words and sounded them out. Our next step is to be able to retell. So next time I'm gonna call on you to retell that paragraph too. So you're providing that goal as well. You're saying, okay, here's our overall goal. Here's how you're working towards it. Here's the next step I'm gonna give you. Wonderful. Love seeing the, those responses. Thank you all for that. And like I said, that's totally not a true story at all. <laughs> So earlier I mentioned that there's, there are some times when feedback doesn't quite work. And that's why at the beginning we started with that Jamboard where we compared times that feedback was helpful and when it was not so helpful. So there are examples of feedback that can actually harm a student and kind of take them back. Um, there's a lot of psychology study around what feedback isn't effective and when it's counterproductive even. So uh, what was found in a lot of this research is that when students feel like they're being too closely monitored, feedback can be really counterproductive, um, kind of like that constant feedback, this feeling like everything I'm doing is going to elicit some kind of feedback. Oh no, what will the teacher say? Even if it's nothing but positive feedback, that constant flow can really harm a student's ability to feel comfortable and ready to perform because they know that there's always gonna be some piece of feedback coming. That's what being goal oriented can really help with. When we're really targeting toward our feedback towards a specific goal, then it keeps us from overly pouring on that feedback so that we're not making the students feel as though they're being overly monitored. Um, an example of this that I sometimes draw upon, um, I'm not good at being coached. And so when I've had coaches in my life to coach me in sports and athletics, it has not gone well. I'm very sensitive to feedback from coaches. And my husband is a very good coach, but he also provides a lot of feedback. So when we're doing a sport together, he gives me a lot of feedback, which is great feedback. But I, as a student, often feel overly monitored, which makes me feel nervous to perform. So that feedback, while it can be really effective, needs to be done in such a way that it's aimed towards a specific goal. Um, when feedback feels controlling, it can also be harmful. So when a student feels as though feedback is being used as a tool to control their actions rather than influence them, they can feel um, a lack of motivation towards performing. We need to make sure that we're using feedback to help students feel that intrinsic motivation, that kind of internal push that says, I can do this. And my teacher is a resource to help me get there. Rather than, oh, my teacher is pushing me towards this and I'm not ready and I don't wanna do it. To help with that, we can return to that idea of being really transparent with our students. That transparency in why we're giving the feedback helps students to feel less controlled and more helped along the way. Then the third idea is the idea of competition. Sometimes competi competition is a great thing in the classroom. I know I'm a very competitive person and I have fun bringing com competition into any of my classes that I teach. But sometimes when feedback is involved, it can create uncomfortable comparisons between students. So we need to be careful in how we are giving that timely feedback. Sometimes feedback in front of the whole class is excellent, but for some students that whole class feedback can be really difficult and it can kind of put up their armor because they feel as though they're being compared to others. So we gotta be careful and gauge our students. That step is all about knowing each of our students and understanding the purpose of the feedback that we're giving. So for example, if we go back to that uh, situation with Molly, if Molly is a student who is really struggling with shyness, I might wait just a little bit to give her feedback. And then once she's done reading, I might go and whisper in her ear and say, great job, 
you did an awesome job reading fluently. I wouldn't necessarily give her that feedback in front of the whole class. There are lots of different methods of giving feedback. And at the end of the day, understanding the examples and ideas of what doesn't work can help you influence how you give your feedback. But if you're ever finding your feedback to not having the effect that, the, if you're ever finding that your feedback doesn't have the effect that you're going for, always return back to that idea of specific, timely, goal-oriented, and transparent. So then when we're giving feedback, we also need to consider that idea of behavior-specific praise. So feedback, it has this whole structure of how I'm aiming us towards this goal. And we are being very specific in the action that is being performed. Behavior-specific praise is very similar. It's a specific form of feedback that's geared to learning and classroom behaviors rather than like academic ability. Um, so we can think about this as a really low intensity strategy to support student success in a lot of ways. These two things go hand in hand in, perform in supporting your classroom culture. So um, once we get into this, I think you'll see how it fits in beautifully. So behavior specific praise is a non judgmental, specific, sincere, and immediate form of feedback. This kind of feedback, because it's not aimed towards a learning goal necessarily, is really easy to pop out in front of your whole class with everybody there as much as you can. Behavior specific praise follows a format of recognizing a student, recognizing the effort that was made, and then recognizing the outcome of that effort. So you start out with behavior-specific praise by identifying that student. Let's say it's James. The student's effort then comes in. You did a great job correcting your spelling. And then we identify that outcome of what they did. I can see the improvement in your writing already. So James's behavior was that he corrected all of his spelling, and as a result, his writing will improve. This is a very short form feedback method that just states who, what, and who, what, ha what they did, and what will become of it because of that action. This helps students to see the cause and effect of their actions in positive ways. So we're going to do a quick practice with this one too. I think this one's a lot, a lot easier to put into practice. So we're just going to jump straight into it. So in this one, Gary is a student who generally does well in class, but struggles with some organizational behaviors. He has a hard time turning in his work on time and will often lose his homework assignments. Just completely, they're gone. Today, he turned in his homework on time, though it wasn't completely finished and it was a little bit torn up. What behavior specific praise could you give him? So consider that kiddo Gary. He has a hard time turning in his homework. He finally got to a place where he turned it in. It wasn't completely finished, but he turned it in. So what behavior specific praise can we consider for this guy? And you're gonna use this third slide of the Jamboard for this one. And so just to remind us of that format, we have who the student is, what effort they showed, and what the outcome of that effort will be. Very nice, Gary. I see you were able to keep track of your homework and turn it in today. I'm glad to see you're being responsible with your materials. So that, that effort there, you turned in your homework, rewarding that effort. 
because that is growth, right? And the result is that he's learning to, he's demonstrating that he's learning to be more responsible with his materials. You turned in your homework today. I can see you want to show how much you've learned and accomplished. I'm looking forward to seeing what you've done. Very nice. Now remember to think about that outcome as far as what it will result in for Gary too. So if Gary's doing this great work with turning in his homework finally, what's that outcome gonna be for him? What good results will he see because he performed this behavior? If we go back to that example with Molly, if we were giving her behavior specific praise, then maybe some of the outcomes that she might see in herself is that she might see herself as being more brave. She might see her own growth. This will help support your classwork and shows responsibility. Beautiful. By turning it in on time, it lets me know you're being responsible with your materials. It lets me see what you've accomplished. Wonderful. I always love seeing what you guys apply this to. Um, it is really great. And the cool thing about behavior specific praise, specifically in my mind, when we, when we think about feedback and behavior specific praise, feedback is kind of this long form of, of giving all of the details of what a student did well, where they're gonna need growth, what steps they need to take. Behavior specific praise, you can just kind of rattle out quickly once you get good at it. Um, I used to even have sentence stems in my plan book for behavior specific praise so that I could go back and make sure that I was giving as much behavior specific praise as I could. And I would reference those sentence stems to help inspire me and keep me on track. I'm proud of the efforts you made to stay organized this week. This shows me that you're growing in the area of responsibility. And that last statement on that blue one is especially strong. This shows me that you're growing in that area. Excellent. Something that personally I like to make sure I'm doing is demonstrating a lot to the student what it shows me about them, that characteristic. Um, and I return a lot to that idea, I'll go back to a previous slide, of the non-judgmental. Um, I didn't explain this well when I was on this slide before, but when you're considering something that's non-judgmental, that doesn't really mean I'm like casting shade on you <laughs> to use some vernacular. Um, it doesn't really mean that you are placing a negative connotation on something. Non-judgmental is really more in reference to our judgment of the situation, whether that's positive or negative. It takes us out of the equation and we put this feedback onto the, what the student has done. Now, another way to think about that is I tend to take out, try to take out words like I like, I love, I admire, because I want the motivation to be as much on the students as possible. Now, as I say that, I recognize too that I've been plenty guilty of placing judgment statements on my feedback that I've given you all in this presentation. But it's something to consider. It's something that's hard, but it's definitely something to consider as we're giving this behavior specific feedback. Am I using this to show the student that I am impressed or do I want the student to be impressed by their own actions? And how can I move from this extrinsic motivation of making a teacher happy towards intrinsic motivation of making myself happy? These are just interesting questions to consider. And they're all things that can help students, absolutely. It's just some ideas to think of. And now in the virtual setting, we also recognize that there are some specific challenges to giving feedback that's immediate and effective. So we need to think about how we can 
step away from the verbal feedback. Now, written feedback is always a great way to go. Um, Google Chrome products uh, and the Google Suite really offer a lot of collaborative means of providing written feedback to students. Um, and as Amanda said earlier, there's also some extensions that can help you provide verbal feedback on student work, which is especially helpful for some of our younger students, but is great for all of our students because that hearing that human voice really helps to create a positive connection with the person on the other end. So uh, extensions like Moat do a great job of letting you add audio to any comment that you leave on one of the Google Suite products. And they really help you to let students know verbally how they're doing. Um, something else that I've been recommending to teachers is scheduling one-on-one -on -one sessions with students. Five to 10 minutes of of one-on-one -on -one sessions where we can sit with a student and provide them feedback is extremely valuable in a lot of ways. Because not only does that give you time to work on that goal setting piece, but it gives you time to build on that connection that the feedback helps you to form. Now, time is always of the essence in online learning. Keep in mind that there's a lot of different scheduling methods that can allow you to have that one-on-one -on -one time with students. And that one-on-one -on -one time can be incredibly valuable for them. And then also, since we're in the online setting, it can be really helpful to kind of shift some of our feedback focus. We focus a lot of our feedback, generally in the classroom setting, on academics and how students are doing with concepts and skills and standards. But in the online setting, we're learning to learn in a whole new environment. And in the online setting, the best kind of learners, the strongest learners, are the ones who know how to learn independently and have a lot of agency over themselves. So when we give feedback, there's some research and study that has so far since the start of the pandemic shown that if we shift our feedback towards the idea of independence, and self-management skills, then our students better learn to self-advocate, they learn independence, and they're better able to problem solve through their, through their frustrations, which makes the whole virtual setting more productive and a much better learning environment. So as you're considering your feedback, take some time as in your planning time to think about how you can give feedback that rewards and guides towards learning independence. Um, and Trisha, I see your question about ideas for scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so as far as scheduling those one-on-one -on -one meetings, I would, I would think about having some kind of a regular rotating schedule for it. Um, maybe my goal would be to meet with five of my students a week, one every day for those one-on-one -on -one sessions that we can provide feedback. Maybe it's two or three students a day, however it can fit. Um, I can tell you, I worked with a high school teacher who actually did his, uh, he had an assessment where he gave that assessment one-on-one -on -one with his students. That way he could kind of avoid some of the cheating issues that they were worried about. And at the same time, he could provide immediate feedback to what he was needing to communicate. Downside, he had to do that with all 150 some odd of his students. Woof, too much. <laughs> Upside, he was able to see and get in contact with every single one of his students. And that helped form such a strong bond with every single one of those kids. So when you're thinking about it in your own classroom, you've got to consider, of course, your own schedules, your own goals, for your feedback and what you want that to look like. If I were thinking about it in terms of reading, for example, each of my students might have a reading goal and I would want to meet with them somewhat regularly to check in on that progress and how it's going. But of course, it's always difficult because everyone's schedules are so different. Um, and I think we're getting close to the end. Anna, if I go over time or if I've already gone over time, feel free to interrupt me and yell at me. I'm just going to wrap this up as quickly as I can. Um, 
So for mom, the cool thing about feedback is that it builds your commu builds communication skills in your classroom. Not only are you modeling for your students ways of communicating feedback with clear, consistent communication, but you're also telling them that it's okay to communicate with each other what's going well and what needs improvement and how we can help each other. Students can take this and practice it. They can practice giving appropriate feedback in your classroom community, and they can also use that to communicate with peers in more constructive ways. So as you're modeling this feedback and giving it, as you're giving the behavior-specific praise, you're also modeling the behavior and helping to give students a method for providing feedback and communicating clearly. Some ideas for bringing students into this include things like Feedback Friday. I've seen a lot of teacher blogs and a few teachers in the district who are starting to bring in the idea of sending out a survey or hearing, finding some way of hearing back from students on a regular basis as far as how's class going? What's going on for you guys? How can we improve this community? Um, there's some evidence to show through case studies, not official research, the, that Feedback Friday and uh, similar methods of students providing feedback to teachers improve student engagement, um, validates the student voice and experience, prevents is a huge preventative classroom management measure, and it's fairly easy to implement. So these are some really big pluses for us. Um, the interesting thing about it to me is that if you've ever been on TikTok or any of those places, you'll see that there's a lot of student frustration around online learning and in their communication with teachers. Things like Feedback Friday really help kids to express that. And so what I did, I threw together a really quick Feedback Friday survey. There's questions on here like, how hard was the work this week? Um, how easy or hard is it for me for you to ask me questions? How comfortable are you reaching out to me? Things of that nature. Uh, responses for what was your favorite learning activity? What was what's something you'd like me to know? And of course, because this is me and I'm a dork, I threw in a question about what which meme best describes your week. So you can kind of get an idea of the mood of your class. Um, and this really helps students to also, it throws in a little bit of a, um, I can provide a copy of this if you'd like, for sure. Um, this can provide a little bit of humor as well. And humor, as I've always said, is a great way of building relationship with students. Um, if you guys would like this feedback form shared with you, then I absolutely can do that. Um, ba -ba -bum. And what I will do is I will go, I, I, blah, blah, blah. here, I'll make a copy of the link and paste it into the chat. And then we, then um, I can also share this with you all through email later. Um, another useful tool is, of course, peer feedback. Peer feedback increases engagement in the classroom and student self-awareness. When they're providing feedback for others and receiving feedback from their peers, it really helps students to be more self-aware of their actions, their behaviors, and their learning methods. And of course, this encourages students to seek one another out as useful resources, develop self-advocacy, and really empower students to feel like experts in the classroom. So, I really do recommend heavily providing students with those opportunities for feedback by first modeling it yourself, giving them the frameworks, and then providing that deeper feedback that they can give each other. Uh, ba -ba -bum. And yes, I saw the request for the sentence stems. I can actually, what I'll do is I'll make that into a nice little document and I can share that out as well. Absolutely. And so I really want to say to thank you guys so much for coming. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's really always a pleasure to speak with the TLFs, 
talk at you <laughs> and work with you in every way that we can. You're all working super hard and I appreciate you taking the time to come and sit in on this presentation and also participate in it, of course. Um, there's going to be a feedback form as well. You've probably received it in other sessions. Make sure to fill that out once you've attended all of these sessions that you want to attend. Your feedback is always super tight, super evaluated and looked over and we always pick it apart to see how we can improve for next time. So make sure to fill that out at the end of your sessions today. Thank you all for coming. And if you have questions, feel free to stick around for a few moments and I would love to chat with you, answer questions and help you out. So thanks a lot for coming guys.